Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The economic survey for the financial year 2019-2020 has been placed in front of the parliament. So naturally, we have multiple articles in today's newspaper. But before we look at these articles, first let us understand what is the economic survey and why it should be an important source for your preparation. See, the economic survey is the flagship annual document of the government of India which is brought out by the finance ministry. It is prepared by the Department of Economic Affairs which is under the finance ministry and it is placed in front of the parliament that is in front of both the houses of the parliament just one day before the union budget. And the economic survey is prepared under the guidance of the chief economic advisor of India. See, between 1951 and 1964, the economic survey was always presented as a part of the union budget. But from 1964 onwards, the economic survey was separated from the budget and since then, it is presented as a separate document one day before the union budget. This flagship annual document of the finance ministry paints a picture of the state of the economy. It reviews the major economic developments of the last financial year. It evaluates the performance of major socio-economic programs and the policies of the government. And it also talks about the prospects for the Indian economy in the near future. That's the reason why the economic survey should be an important part of your preparation. That is for both prelims and mains. Because the economic survey talks about the major economic developments of the last one year. It reviews the functioning of various socio-economic programs and policy initiatives of the government of India. And it also presents a way forward to promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth for the coming financial year. See, the chief economic advisor is a post within the government of India. And this post has the same rank as that of the secretary to the government of India. By virtue of his post, the chief economic advisor serves as the head of the economic division within the Department of Economic Affairs of the Finance Ministry and he reports directly to the Finance Minister. He basically serves as a key advisor to the Government of India on various economic and financial matters. While appointing the Chief Economic Advisor, the Government can select a candidate either from within the Government or it can bring an expert from the outside. Some of the popular chief economic advisors in the past include Manmohan Singh, Bimal Jalan, Kaushik Basu, Raghuram Rajan, Arvind Subramanyam and the current chief economic advisor is Mr. Krishnamurti Subramanyam. One of the key responsibilities of the chief economic advisor is to assist the government in drafting an overall strategy for managing the Indian economy. He also advises the government on various matters related to finance, commerce, trade and economy. The economic division of the Department of Economic Affairs, which functions under the Chief Economic Advisor, monitors both domestic and international trends and it also studies the impact of these domestic and global developments on the Indian economy and provides suitable advice to the government. Apart from these key responsibilities, the Chief Economic Advisor also functions as the ex-officio Carter Controlling Authority of the Indian Economic Service and he plays a key role in the preparation of the annual economic survey which is presented to the parliament one day prior to the union budget. And the inputs provided by the chief economic advisor and the key highlights of the economic survey also contribute to the preparation of the union budget. Now coming back to the articles on the economic survey in today's newspaper, we have an article on the front page of the Delhi edition which provides an overview of the economic survey. This year's economic survey formally recognizes India as the fifth largest economy in the world after the United States, China, Japan and Germany. According to the economic survey, as of 2019, the Indian economy is estimated to be valued at around $2.9 trillion and the government is hoping to make India a $5 trillion economy by 2025. So the economic survey tries to draw a roadmap to help the government 
to realize this ambitious objective. Then on the GDP front, the economic survey recognizes that there has been an economic slowdown in India. In the first half of the current financial year, GDP growth has been at around 5% and this is the slowest economic growth that India has registered in the last 11 years. But the economic survey hopes that growth would pick up in the second half of the financial year and it also expects the GDP growth to improve from the current 5% to around 6 to 6.5% by the next financial year. The economic survey makes this prediction by looking at some of the improvements in key indicators. The economic survey has pointed out that the index of industrial production has improved over the last couple of months. The PMI index or the purchasing managers index for the manufacturing sector has shown an improvement over the last couple of months. GST revenue collection has also improved slightly and Nifty India consumption index has also picked up. So by highlighting the improvements in these key indicators, the economic survey expects that GDP growth would improve to 5% in the current financial year and it expects it to further improve to around 6 to 6.5% by the next financial year. The economic survey blames the current slowdown in India's GDP on global factors and on the policies of the previous UPA government. The economic survey also indicates that the government is willing to increase its expenditure in order to revive growth in the economy even at the cost of breaching its fiscal deficit targets. The economic survey also talks about the complexity of regulations in India and how it affects wealth creation and entrepreneurship. So in order to unlock the wealth creation potential of the Indian industry, the economic survey places a lot of stress on simplifying the regulatory environment in India. It also recognizes the need to create more jobs in order to counter rising unemployment. The economic survey identifies six key sectors and it lays down an ambitious target to create around 4 crore jobs by 2025 and around 8 crore jobs by 2030. Then on the food inflation front, the economic survey says that the recent rise in food prices was an outcome of few supply side constraints. The economic survey expects these constraints to ease over the coming months and hence it expects the current food inflation to be a temporary phase and it does not expect this to be a mid-term or long-term feature. The economic survey even makes use of behavioral economics to justify that food inflation is well under control. It makes use of a wedge thali as a barometer to measure food inflation and it says that Eating a thali has become more affordable over the years, especially for vegetarians. Economic experts are popularly calling this reference as thalinomics. Another interesting feature of this year's economic survey is that it provides for a synthesis of ancient India's achievements with current goals of the Indian economy. It carefully provides for a synthesis of contemporary economic evidence with ancient texts. The economic survey says that during the ancient and medieval times, India was a dominant economic powerhouse and one of the prominent wealth creators in the world for nearly three-fourths of known economic history. It indicates that socialistic principles and socialistic instincts of post-independent India has held back the Indian economy and it is asking us to move away from these misplaced priorities and instincts in order to help India retain its past glory. In this context, the economic survey refers to ancient texts of 4th century Tamil poet Tiruvalluvar's Tirukural and Kautilya's Arthashastra to highlight the significance of a market-based economy which can unlock the spirit of the entrepreneurs which can help in wealth creation. Now let's take up an article from page number 13 which refers to the controversy surrounding India's GDP calculation and this year's economic survey tries to address this controversy. See, over the last few months, several economic experts have raised questions over the methodology that India has adopted for calculating its GDP. According to these experts, 
India's GDP calculation is inaccurate and unreliable. These doubts began to emerge when former Chief Economic Advisor Mr. Arvind Subramanian published a research paper for Harvard University. In this research paper, he claimed that India's GDP methodology was flawed and as a result, India's GDP had been consistently overestimated between the period 2011 to 2017. During this period, the official GDP growth claimed by the government was 7%. But according to the research paper, if the inaccuracies and flaws in the GDP calculation methodology are accounted for, then India's GDP growth during this period was hardly around 4.5%. So these claims of Arvind Subramanian triggered a debate and it led the opposition parties to accuse the government of fudging the GDP data. Even the IMF started raising questions over the authenticity and accuracy of India's GDP calculation methodology. So in order to address this controversy, this year's economic survey dedicates an entire chapter to this topic. In this chapter, the economic survey claims that reports of inaccurate and unreliable GDP calculation is unfounded and there is no evidence available to justify these claims. See, the economic survey recognizes that GDP numbers are a key indicator for any investor who is looking to invest in the Indian economy. So it is very essential for the government to provide accurate and reliable GDP numbers in order to boost investor confidence. And if the GDP methodology is being referred to as flawed, then it is bound to affect investor confidence. So the economic survey tries to address these concerns by claiming that the model developed by Arvind Subramanian is flawed because this model had wrongly estimated the GDP of several other countries as well which were studied as a part of this research. The economic survey points out that around 95 countries were studied as a part of this research and out of these 95 countries, the GDP of nearly 51 countries was wrongly estimated because of flaws in the model developed by Arvind Subramanian. The economic survey points out that even advanced economies such as UK, Germany and Singapore have had their GDPs wrongly estimated by this model developed by Arvind Subramanian and hence it rejects these claims by stating that they are unfounded and lack evidence. But however, the economic survey recognizes the shortcomings in India's statistical exercises and it highlights the need to make more investments in order to improve India's statistical infrastructure. In this regard, the role of the Standing Committee on Economic Statistics would be very crucial. See, recently, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation has constituted a 28-member Standing Committee on Economic Statistics. This committee is headed by Pranob Sen, who happens to be India's first chief statistician. The recommendations of this committee will go a long way in improving India's statistical exercises and the economic survey recognizes the need to implement these recommendations by making adequate investments. Now let's take up another article from page number 13. The economic survey has said that the Essential Commodities Act is outdated and hence it must be repealed. But before we look at this article, first let us understand what is the Essential Commodities Act? See, the Essential Commodities Act was enacted in 1955 to help the government to control prices and regulate the demand and supply of essential commodities. This legislation was brought in in order to protect the consumers from price volatility and prevent traders and sellers from resorting to holding and black marketing. See, commodities such as drugs, fertilizers, pulses, basic vegetables, edible oils, petroleum products, etc. are very essential for people to lead a normal day-to-day -day life. And any price volatility in these essential products will directly affect the well-being of the consumer. Prices of such essential commodities can fluctuate because of supply shortage and this could be either because of genuine supply-side constraints or because of illegal practices such as holding or black marketing. 
So in order to regulate the prices of such essential commodities, the Essential Commodities Act was brought in and it empowers the government to regulate the production, the supply and distribution of a number of essential commodities. It also allows the government to add new commodities to the list and remove them from the list as and when the situation improves. Under this legislation, the supply and prices of essential commodities can be regulated by the government by imposing stock limits on traders, sellers and importers. They are basically not allowed to store essential commodities beyond the specified stock limits. So whenever there is a significant shortage of an essential commodity, the government intervenes in the market and places a stock limit in order to regulate the prices. We recently saw this happening when there was a severe shortage of onions in the market. When the prices of onions started going above 150 rupees per kilogram, the government decided to make use of its extraordinary powers under the Essential Commodities Act and it started imposing stock limits on traders, sellers and importers. So on one hand, this legislation appears to be very essential in order to protect the interests of the consumer and prevent illegal practices such as holding and black marketing. But please remember that this legislation was introduced in 1955 when there was a severe shortage of essential items due to poorly developed markets, inadequate infrastructure and frequent droughts, floods and famines. So the economic survey says that the conditions in India in 2020 are not exactly the same and hence the legislation has become outdated according to the economic survey. Because see, in any market-based economy, the prices of a product should be regulated by the demand supply conditions in the market. When the government frequently intervenes to regulate supply and prices, it erodes innovation and investment in a market-based economy. See, the government does need extraordinary powers to prevent holding and black marketing in order to protect the interests of the consumer. But according to the economic survey, the Essential Commodities Act is not the answer. Because the Essential Commodities Act does not distinguish between genuine stock holding and speculative holding. See, when you're dealing with essential commodities, especially food items, their production is subjected to seasonal changes and to natural calamities such as floods and droughts. So if adequate supply has to be maintained even during such circumstances, you need to allow the traders and the sellers to build up a genuine stock. See, for example, if you look at the recent increase in the prices of onions, it was an outcome of supply shortage caused due to floods in the major onion producing states. Economic experts believe that onion traders were not prepared for this supply shock because the Essential Commodities Act does not allow them to build up a genuine stock holding and it does not promote the creation of storage infrastructure. Since the Essential Commodities Act does not distinguish between genuine stock holding and speculative holding, it discourages the traders from creating adequate storage infrastructure for building up a genuine stock which could have helped in tiding over such temporary phases of crisis. So the Essential Commodities Act not only discourages the private investors from investing in storage logistics such as modern warehousing and cold storage facilities but it also fails to effectively prevent price volatility in the market. That's the reason why the economic survey argues that the Essential Commodities Act is outdated and it must be repealed. The economic survey makes the same argument for the drug price control order as well. See, the drug price control order has been issued under the Essential Commodities Act. This order also functions in exactly the same manner and it regulates the production and supply of essential drugs in order to regulate its prices. But the economic survey says that the drug price control order has ended up distorting the pharmaceutical market and it has also made essential medicines more expensive. Next, on page number 13, we have an article on the economic survey which provides us an insight into the education sector. The economic survey has noted 
that higher fees at higher education institutions keeps the poor and the underprivileged students out of the education system. The economic survey also refers to the national sample survey data of 2017 and 18 to show that participation in education has increased in general over the years. Even though participation in education has increased, the economic survey identifies the key challenges that are facing the education sector, especially higher education in India. The economic survey identifies that the key challenge to improving participation in education is affordability. The national sample survey data shows that around 13.6% of the students in the 3 to 35 years age group could not be enrolled in the education system because they were not able to afford the fees due to their financial constraints. See, both in the rural areas and the urban areas, the highest proportion of spending is on fees, that is academic fees. Apart from this, students also have to bear the cost of books, uniform, stationery, etc. The combined cost of this makes education unaffordable especially for the poor and the marginal sections. And this fact has been clearly brought out by this year's economic survey. Apart from this, the economic survey also talks about the need to improve the quality of education and the need to equitably distribute education infrastructure across the country. Because right now, quality educational institutions are concentrated only in a few pockets of the country and they need to be equitably distributed. Next, the economic survey has a dedicated section for startups. The economic survey recognizes that startups play a key role in promoting innovation, job creation and wealth creation. The economic survey recognizes that in order to unlock this potential of startups, India's ease of doing business has to be further improved and the complex regulations have to be relaxed. See, even though India has made considerable progress in improving its ease of doing business over the last few years, it is still quite difficult and cumbersome to start a new business in India. This is where the chief economic advisor draws a comparison between guns and restaurants. He says that to open a new restaurant in Delhi, you need around 45 documents. Whereas to acquire a licensed gun, you just need around 19 documents. Then if you look at the procedures and the time involved in starting a new business in India, you need around 18 days and you need to complete around 10 procedures. And if you compare this with New Zealand, which occupies the top spot on the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, you just need to fill out one form and it takes just half a day to start a new business. See, over the last few years, India has made considerable progress in improving its ease of doing business ranking. India has managed to bring down the time and the procedures involved in starting a new business. India has made considerable progress in issuing construction permits. The same can be said about providing electricity connections as well. But India's performance is lagging behind with regard to registration of property and enforcement of contracts. According to the economic survey, it takes around four years to enforce a contract in India. In comparison, contracts are enforced in New Zealand within six months. Even if you look at Indonesia, China and Brazil, they take hardly more than one year to enforce contracts. But in India, enforcement of contracts on an average takes around four years. So this points to drawbacks in our regulatory and legal environment and the economic survey is focused on addressing these concerns in order to create a fertile ground for startups. Next, on the environment front, the economic survey focuses on the impact of stubble burning on air quality in the NCR region. The economic survey notes that the incidence of stubble burning, especially in Punjab and Haryana, has declined over the last one year as compared to the previous year. But the failure of the state governments in strictly enforcing the ban on stubble burning has resulted in the continuation of this practice, which releases large quantities of PM2.5 and PM10, which is primarily responsible 
for the deterioration of air quality in and around the NCR region. So in order to address this environmental crisis, the economic survey suggests that state authorities should first strictly enforce the ban on stubble burning. Then it also provides for a few suggestions in order to create alternative applications for the stubble that is left behind after the harvest of the crop. The economic survey suggests these measures under the title Promotion of Agriculture Conservation. By encouraging crops with low lignocellulosic crop residue, we can easily convert the stubble into biofuel. Then the economic survey also suggests that the crop residue that is left behind can be used in the production of briquettes. See, briquettes are basically small pellets that are made by compressing coal and peat in order to be used as fuel. The economic survey suggests that instead of using coal or peat, the stubble or the crop residue can be compressed into these small pellets known as briquettes, which in turn can be used as a fuel. Then it also suggests the diversion of crop residue to thermal power plants that are located nearby where they can be used as a fuel. So by trying to develop such alternative applications for crop residue, the economic survey is trying to incentivize the farmers to not carry out stubble burning. Next, on the manufacturing front, the economic survey says that India can emerge as a major export hub just like China if it focuses on a select group of labor-intensive industries known as network products. See, the term network products refers to a group of industries where a product is manufactured in different components. These different components are made in different locations in different countries and they are finally brought together in one country and they are assembled. Such network product industries are usually run by multinational corporations. For example, if you look at companies such as Apple, the microprocessor which is used in its phones would have been designed in the United States, the screen would have been manufactured in South Korea, the camera and the speaker would have been manufactured in Japan. But all these components are finally brought together in one country, such as China, where cheap labor and the right infrastructure is available. And in such countries, all these components are brought together and finally assembled to make one single product. This industry is a labor-intensive industry. So the economic survey is asking India to follow this model. It is asking the government to integrate its Assemble in India for the World initiative with the Make in India initiative so that India can emerge as a manufacturing hub and as well as an export hub. According to the economic survey, if India focuses on these labor-intensive network products industry, then India's export market share can increase to 3.5% by 2025 and it can increase to 6% by 2030. And since the network product industry is labor-intensive, it can also create numerous jobs which will help us tackle the problem of unemployment. According to estimates brought out by the economic survey, this strategy can help us create 4 crore jobs by 2025 and 8 crore jobs by 2030. See, the only drawback of focusing on the assembly of labor-intensive network products is that you're not adding any value to the product. Basically, there is no value addition that would be taking place in India. But it will definitely help create numerous jobs and it will help India increase its market share in global exports. Then the economic survey also draws a comparison between India and China with regard to the pattern of exports. See, China, which has already emerged as a manufacturing hub and a leading exporter of the world, shows a lot of diversification in the type of products that it exports and it also shows a very high degree of specialization in its products. But if you look at India, India is showing some progress with regard to diversification. Of late, the variety of products being exported out of India has diversified drastically and India is on its way to catch up with China. But when it comes to specialization and value addition, India is seen to be lagging behind China. This is where India needs to create a niche area for itself. For example, if you look at China, 
it has a number of niche areas. For example, electronics, automobiles and consumer goods are some of the niche areas of China. So India needs to focus on building such specialization into its exports as well. Now let's take up an article from page number 12 which refers to a major restructuring in the Ministry of External Affairs. Newly appointed Foreign Secretary Harsh Vardhan Shringla has approved a major restructuring and reorganization of tasks within the Ministry of External Affairs after consulting with Foreign Minister S. Jai Shankar, who himself has been the Foreign Secretary for four years between 2015 and 2018. As a part of this restructuring exercise, the tasks within the Ministry that were carried out at the additional secretary level have been reorganized. They have been reorganized on the themes of culture, trade and development, etc. While carrying out this reorganization, special attention has been given to the 8 million diaspora who reside and work in the West Asia North Africa region and special attention has also been given to the external publicity division of the Ministry of External Affairs. These changes have been brought in in order to promote strategic and long-term thinking within the ministry and to streamline the functioning of various divisions. See, currently, offices at the secretary level are overburdened with their day-to-day -day work and hence, they do not have sufficient time for strategic thinking. So, these changes that have been approved are expected to give more time at the level of additional secretaries so that they can focus on strategic and long-term thinking. Now let's take up the practice questions. Which of the following statements are correct? The President's special address to the Parliament has been provided under Article 87 of the Constitution. In the case of the first session after each general election, the President addresses only the newly elected Lok Sabha and later the members subscribe to the oath or affirmation and the Speaker is elected. In the case of the first session of each year, the President addresses both Houses of the Parliament. The President's speech essentially highlights the government's policy priorities and plans for the upcoming year. Amongst the given statements, the second statement is incorrect. See, under Article 87, the special address of the President has been provided. There are two occasions on which the President delivers a special address to the Parliament. One is during the first session after each general election. During this address, the President addresses both the Houses of the Parliament and not just the newly elected Lok Sabha. So this makes the second statement incorrect. The second instance where the President delivers a special address to the Parliament is at the first session of each year. That is before the start of the budget session and during this special address, the President addresses both the Houses of the Parliament again. And this special address of the President always highlights the policy priorities of the government and the plans of the government for the upcoming year. So the correct answer is option C, 1, 3, 4 only. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 1 which refers to the address of the President that was delivered to both the Houses of the Parliament before the start of the budget session. Now let us take up the second practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? Crop dusting refers to aerial spraying of insecticides or pesticides on crops. The Insecticide Act of 1968 has banned aerial spraying due to its ecological impact. As per the provisions of Insecticides Act, aerial application of pesticides needs approval from the Central Insecticides Board. All the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. This question has been asked because we have a related article on page number 8. This article refers to the illegal usage of drones or unmanned aerial vehicles in carrying out crop dusting. Considering the ecological impact and health impact of aerial spraying of insecticides and pesticides, the center has reminded that crop dusting is illegal and if it has to be carried out, explicit permission has to be obtained from the Central Insecticides Board as specified under the Insecticides Act of 1968. Now let us take up the third practice question. Which of the following statements are correct? Kautilya's Arthashastra discusses a mixed economic model where private enterprise and state enterprise 
frequently competed side by side. Private economic activities were regulated via royal statutes and officials and some economic activity was the monopoly of the state. Arthashastra states that protecting the consumer must be an important priority for the officials of the kingdom. All the three statements are correct, so option C is the right answer. So as you can see, Kautilya's Arthashastra was way ahead of its times and that's the reason why this popular treatise is still studied and referred to this day with regard to public administration, governance, war, espionage, taxation, etc. Now let us take up a map-based question. Which of the following statements are correct? Someshwara Wildlife Sanctuary is located in the Western Ghats of Karnataka. It is located in a semi-arid region with dry deciduous and thorny forests. The first statement is correct. The second statement is incorrect. So option A is the right answer. Please look at this map. This is where the Someshwara Wildlife Sanctuary is located. It is located in Western Ghats. It is located in the state of Karnataka. And it can be found in the Udupi and Shumoga districts of Karnataka. In the Western Ghats, the type of forest you find is not semi-arid and thorny forests. Instead, you come across tropical evergreen and semi-evergreen forests. And the region also has moist deciduous type of forests. In fact, Agumbe, which is located within the Someshwara Wildlife Sanctuary, receives one of the highest rainfalls in the country and it belongs in the same bracket as that of Mohsin Ram and Chirapunji of Meghalaya. Now let us take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. With reference to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, consider the following statements. It is an agreement among all the Pacific Rim countries except China and Russia. It is a strategic alliance for the purpose of maritime security only. Both the statements are incorrect. Option D is the right answer. Because see, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a proposed free trade agreement. It is supposed to create a trade block in the Pacific region. So it is not a strategic alliance meant for maritime security only. And this free trade agreement was signed in 2016 by 12 countries that are located along the Pacific Rim. It does not involve all the countries of the Pacific Rim. Please look at this map. The Trans-Pacific Partnership includes Canada, United States, Mexico, Peru, Chile, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Vietnam and Brunei. This agreement was signed in 2016 between 12 countries. But within one year in 2017, US President Donald Trump decided to unilaterally quit the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So right now, the United States is no longer a part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, of late, the estimation of GDP in India is said to be inaccurate and unreliable. How does the 2020 economic survey address these concerns? The second question, critically evaluate the relevance of Essential Commodities Act of 1955. So kindly write an answer to these questions and post them in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.